Our presenter today is Justin Behrens. Um, Justin is a veteran of the U.S. Army where he served for 12 years. He served in Iraq and Guantanamo Bay. He has 13 years of crisis experience working with individuals that are living with suicidal thoughts. So he's very experienced on this topic. Uh, presently, Justin is the Director of Mental Health Forensics at Northeast Counseling Services where he deals with mental health and reentry in the prison environment. He also serves on NASWPA's Board of Directors as the Northeast Division Chair. Uh, in addition, Justin is currently running for Pennsylvania State Representative for the 119th District. Uh, so obviously very excited to have you on today, Justin. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, so today's topic actually is a response to suicide risk in the LGBTQIA community. For those that um, don't know what LGBTQIA stands for, that's um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, and allies. So I'm going to be going through these slides, and like Tyler said, I will stop it periodically to take some questions. Um, but if your question is not answered, at the very end is my email address. Feel free to send me an email um, with your question and I will get back to you. Um, and I believe that the e um, presentation is actually attached to this so that you guys can download the presentation also. So going on, um, in actually Nebraska, and I, I, this is an interesting uh, part that I um, came across, was in Nebraska they did a study and they, uh, they asked which of the suicide prevention practices are going on in their local areas. And if you notice uh, in this slide, which I find very interesting is, is that majority of the present, um, majority of it is actually uh, training in the suicidal behavior health, which is what we are doing here, um, along with um, screening practices. Uh, and you'll notice that when it comes to the minority groups of people, um, there's less practices being done in that area. And, and that's why I'm kind of excited about um, this presentation in that we take a broad spectrum um, of suicide um, or suicidology, and then we now narrow it down into a specific category, which is our uh, LGBTQIA. So that's why I'm excited about this presentation. Um, you're going to notice throughout the slides that there's a lot about youth and young adult uh, suicide um, in this population, and I think that's important to understand, and you'll see why uh, as we go on. In this slide, you'll notice um, it's talking about suicide is the second leading cause of death of youth and young adults. That's 15 to 24-year-olds uh, in the United States. Over 4,800 youths or young adults, uh, 15 to 24, commit suicide, and about one out of every 13 high, high school students attempt suicides each year. Individuals in the LGBTQIA community are up to seven times more likely to attempt suicide. Throughout this presentation, you're going to see that uh, in this population, if we take out the LGBTQIA community, you're going to notice it goes down the suicidal attempts, but as we add this special population in, it goes up, and you're going to see why that happens uh, when we get to risk factors and um, protective factors. So suicide is a major public health issue. Um, the reason why this is is that it affects a large number of people, and prevention is based on research that is mostly related to risk factors. So it's important that uh, suicide can be prevented. Um, that's why we're doing this. Uh, that's why I think that it was made uh, mandatory to take a one credit class for this. Uh, this is becoming a very uh, major public epidemic um, out there in throughout Pennsylvania and to even go throughout the whole country. So the objective is I want to uh, get everyone to use the correct terminology for suicidal behavior and also the LGBTQIA issues. Describe research related to suicidal behavior among LGBTQA uh, youth or members. Um, discuss risk and protective factors with suicidal behaviors in the LGBTQIA. Um, and access to cultural competencies in schools relations to LGBTQIA youth. And plan the next steps to increase uh, the cultural competency. And strategies to reduce um, suicidal behavior among LGBTQIA youth. Um, this has been a growing thing. We've seen it in the, um, the movies. We've seen it in, throughout um, TV uh, shows. Um, it's becoming a, out there in the front. And, and 
we're trying to figure out what is the reasons why behind all of this um, that we're seeing an increase. So we also have, as we know with suicide, we have individuals, family, and social aspects that will all affect the individual that um, wants to um, try to commit suicide. Um, we also know that there's a link of mental health illness attached to that, um, especially with depression and anxiety. And if you remember my ra my last presentation, um, anxiety has been linked um, very uh, close to suicide. Um, with those that have severe anxiety, um, there is actually a risk of um, suicidal tendencies. There are other risk factors associated with su uh, suicidals, which include uh, previous suicide attempts, firearm ownership, isolation, hopelessness, impulsiveness and recklessness, family discord and dysfunction, and ongoing exposure to negative environments such as abuse, neglect, bullying, peer, and vic victimization. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this in that these are the, the risk factors that are affecting, um, that make someone high risk of suicide. Now when we go into the community of LGBTQIA, you can kind of see why that there's a higher risk of uh, individuals that are trying to take their lives in this population. When we talk about cultural competency, we need to understand um, the different aspects of the LGBTQIA community. Um, I found this actually uh, at a presentation that I went to before, which I like, the gender-bred person. Um, it it kind of helps you explain um, the different categories uh, and, and the different areas um, in this population. There's so many aspects to it. Um, everyone has heard all the different terms that are out there, but this really, in a nutshell, it, it kind of explains a lot of um, the individuals. So you have the gender identity, um, and that's the, how they, sh um, in their head, how they think about themselves um, and how, how they feel. Um, there's gender expression. Do they, you know, how they demonstrate their uh, their gender roles, how they dress, act, behave. Um, biological, which is member in the LGBTQIA, the intersex uh, intersex is, begins with the I. That's obviously how they um, the body is composed. Um, if they have both the male or the female body parts, um, or both. And then the sexual orientation, um, how they feel physically, spiritually, and emotionally attracted to the individual. Um, it's important to understand, especially in the uh, transgender uh, population, part of it, that they are what they identify, how they identify themselves. Um, I have a friend of mine who uh, presently right now um, it has all the female parts, um, but identifies himself as a male um, and is attracted to females. So he considers himself heterosexual um, because that's how they, how he identifies himself. Going on, I just went the wrong way, I apologize. Um, I wanna go over the terminology for suicidalology. And then after this, I'll, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to take um, maybe one or two. There's four terminologies for suicidology. Um, the first one is suicide death. Um, that terminology refers to actually as um, the individual has completed the suicide attempt and has actually um, passed away. Um, the next one is attempt suicide. Um, with this one, this is actually uh, referring to the potential self-injurious behavior uh, outcome for which the evidence that the person is intended to kill himself or herself. So like in a suicide attempt may or may not result in injury. And that's what a suicide attempt would be. Suicide ideation, um, that's the self-reporting thoughts of engaging in self-related behavior. So they have those thoughts that are coming in their head that, you know, I really want to hurt myself. Um, and, and then there's a suicide behavior, which is a spectrum of activities related to thoughts or behaviors that includes suicidal thinking, suicidal attempts, and completed suicides. So the suicide behavior incorporates the three before. Um, at this time, I'm going to stop. I don't know if Tyler, you have any questions? Uh, no questions yet. Um, we That's did have, like to hear. yeah, right. We did have one person mention um, the discrepancy with the letter Q in LGBTQ. Um, I guess the you know some people see that as queer. Some people see that as questioning. Um, so I think it's probably good to note that that. Uh, is is often seen two different ways. Correct, and and actually, I 
whoever wrote that, I appreciate you bringing that out. I went to a seminar. Um, this was about a month ago, uh, and the person was using the word questioning, and I brought that up too. And they're trying to it, these the acronym always is changing um, continuously over and over again. I don't know. I know that they had uh, LGBTQIAS plus, which was the spiritual part of it, which was part of the Native American piece of it. Um, so it, it's always changing. Um, and I appreciate that. Thank you for whoever addressed that. And then you, you said that A uh, stood for, I think, ally, correct? Um, Allies, yes. Um, people, someone had mentioned also that A can stand for asexual. So, <laughs> so yeah, like, like you were saying, it looks like there's, it's constantly changing. Um, probably good to be on, you know, be on top of the constant trends and, and seeing what is most accepted, you know, at, at, at each current time. Correct. And, and that's the, um, like there was a, like I said, with the two plus and the S plus, there was all the different um, acronyms that are there. Going on, um, in this community, there's about one and a half to three times more likely to report suicidal ideations than um, the non-LGBTQIA youth. 48% um, of the LGBTQIA youth between 14 and 21 said suicidal thoughts are clearly or less somewhat related to their sexual orientation. Um, I think these statistics are important. Um, and as we go on, you're going to see why these rates are so high um, compared to other populations because of what they're, what they're experiencing and what's going on actually, obviously in the environment that, they're, um, that we're living in right now. Um, LGBTQIA youth are two to seven times more likely to have said that they attempted suicide than a uh, non-LGBTQIA youth. That number is uh, phenomenal. Uh, that, to me, that's a scary number. Um, it shows us, especially in this um, workforce, that we really need to pay attention um, and start recognizing the risk factors and really trying to implement how we can help them and, and move the individuals to be safe and feel like they're, you know, that they are in a safe environment, um, that they don't have to have to feel this way. Um, youth attempts may be more serious based on initial findings about um, lethality and intent to end their lives. So this is a very, this is a scary, to me, a very scary um, statistics because if you think about it, um, and I'll go on, there's going to be a slide here, and I'll, I'll leave it when I get to that slide. It, it's looking almost like almost 50% of the of the population we're looking at um, in this have either experienced or have thought about um, suicide. There's no reliable or official way to determine rates of suicidal deaths in people who are uh, LGBTQA because the death reports or certificates do not usually include the person's sexual orientation. Um, we all know that... Uh, it's in this time that we're living in right now. Um, very rarely do you see have have I seen an application that says um, how do you identify yourself? I always see male, uh, female, or other. Um, I don't see how the specifics on that when I see applications, and that goes to include obviously getting good statistics for the um, the death part for the death certificates compared to non LGBTQA youth. Um, there's a higher rate of suicide attempts, and there's also um, a higher rate of suicide attempts that may be more serious, um, which shows to me that when it's more serious, it, this is something that's taking emotional effect um, and that there is a higher rate of more deaths out there. So here's what I was going back to was that 46% um, of all transgender youth under the age of 26 will attempt suicide. Now, if I just want to round that up to 50, that's half of the transgender youth under the age of 26 attempt suicide. That is a scary statistic um, in this population. And to go on to that, and if I round that number up to 60, but 59% self-harm on a regular basis. There's obviously a lot of um, emotional hurt going on here. There's also a lot of things that are going on in our environment that need to be changed that we need to try to make this a safe environment for everyone so that this number does not go any higher um, and that we can lower that number. So risk factors and protective factors. Um, being in this community is, in itself um, is a risk factor in that you can see that by those numbers, 
just let alone show that 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 there is a risk factor attached to this. But I want to say that the social stigma and discrimination of unsafe schools and bullying are what are causing these mood changes, the anxiety, the substance use disorder, and the social, uh, the suicidal behavior. So we can see that because we're in an unsafe school and uh, unsafe schools and bullying, and I also want to say also unsafe environment. Um, it's difficult nowadays in this population um, going out there and being identified because what's happening is is people are there is that bullying that's going on um, and it's they don't feel safe they feel that discrimination and the stigma uh, of there which causes obviously you can see the mood anxiety substance disorder um, and then the suicidal behavior at the end so Here's another interesting statistics between rural and urban areas. I know in some parts of Pennsylvania, because um, I know I have many people here all across the state of Pennsylvania, they live, some people live in the rural area and some people will live in the urban area. Um, those that live in the oral, oral area, um, they're, the faculty and staff are um, less supportive. They feel less connected to the schools than the, uh, the urban and the suburban areas. And that also also includes with the regular environment itself. Um, I've noticed that when you go out into a rural area, it, it, there's a lot of um, traditional family values, and a lot of um, very, very conservative ways of thinking. Um, and it's very difficult for an individual that is, um, in the LGBTQIA environment to fit in or feel that they fit in, um, opposed to the urban and um, suburban areas where there's the, there's much more resources out there for them to reach out to. And we're gonna talk about some of those resources um, later on in these slides that they can reach out to for help um, and also feel that you know they're part of a community also. Um, Tyler, are there any questions at this point? Um, I think there are. Let's see. Um, so I think you kind of touched on this, but one of the questions was, are there any statistics about the rate of suicide or success of suicide of uh, the LGBTQIA community as compared with the non-LGBTQIA community? So I guess specifically. Yeah, I did say, I, it, it's actually what's going around is, is actually um, – when it comes to the, it almost is the, everything I've been reading says it's almost like it's like a 50% increase just mm. by being in this community. Um, and, and they're saying the community, the point I want to get across too is it's not because they're LGBTQIA um, identifying themselves as that. What it is, is it because the environment is not accepting of the community um, that they're in, which then they feel that there's, we all know that when you start feeling out of place, um, you start people start judging you, people start throwing that stigma and start throwing those things in there. Those risk factors start going higher and higher and higher. And then now you're at a, a, a higher rate of attempting suicide or having suicidal ideations. And so that's specifically for the success of the suicide attempt? Or, or that... ideations or thinking, um, okay. the thinking piece of it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything else? Ah, uh, that's it for now. Okay. So protective factors, th these are very important. Um, and I think that um, we're getting better as a society with this, um, but we're nowhere near where we should be. Um, we have family correctedness and family acceptance. Um, we're starting to try to have our connectedness. We're trying to, the family network, we all know that the um, family and social supports are very important when it comes to um, those individuals that have suicidal ideations or, or they're, are thinking about doing suicide. Um, that the connection of the family network uh, and, and acceptance. There's a video at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm not going to be playing that video, but I want people to watch that video. I think it's kind of important. Um, it talks about the individuals that are in this community that have taken their lives. Um, and one of the common themes that you'll see there is actually that family acceptance. Um, they don't feel accepted. Either the mother, there's one sign, um, there's one piece that's kind of, it's kind of emotional, so I, I want people to understand that too. Um, the child is actually giving his, um, basically his farewell YouTube video, um, and actually he holds up a sign that says, you know, mom, I love you, thank you for accepting me, and then the next sign he holds up is, father, why couldn't you accept me? And then the next sign he holds up is, Father, I still love you. Um, 
if maybe his father showed somewhat of some acceptance, you know, maybe he'd still be here today. Um, that's a big protective factor, making sure that the family is there to support. Um, the next piece is safe schools. Um, we all hear about, you know, the shootings that are going on in schools, the bullying, the bullying that's going on in schools. Um, our children are supposed to go to school to be safe um, and, and to learn and get educated. They're not there to be um, feeling like it's not safe environment. There are programs out there right now that are being done to help make those schools safe, um, especially the anti-bullying um, process. So that's another protective factor, making sure that there's a safe environment in the school. Caring adults, that's where we play a, our role um, in. Um, we need to make sure that um, we are caring, that we really show the compassion, the empathy, and that we reach out to them when we can. High self-esteem. Um, I'll tell you that uh, in this population that with a high self-esteem that they know that the environment and the community will change their way of thinking, um, keep positive, keep looking in the right direction. That's going to um, play an, um, an important role in this and positive role models. Um, we all know that we all look up to somebody out there, that there's someone that we want to make sure that um, we want to be to, we want to inspire to. Um, and this community needs also to have role models also to look up to and say, hey, listen, you know, I made it through this process. I made it through everything. You know, um, I have a loving family now. I'm safe for an environment that I'm in. It can be done, too. Um, I'm here to help you out. Let's figure out how we can get in the right direction. Um, Here's some interesting facts. Um, I found this poster slide here. It says, uh, and the LGBT students feel unsafe in their school because of sexual orientation is six out of 10 individuals. Um, four out of 10 individuals feel unsafe in their school because of their gender expression. Um, like I said, we're not there yet. Um, we still need to continue to work on trying to make sure that we have a safe environment out there for everyone. Um, in doing this, it shows that there's still that they still feel like they're getting bullied. They still feel that they're still out of place, that, um, you know, I feel there's that different piece that goes on. I know that um, when I work with individuals that have schizophrenia, uh, that are living with schizophrenia, that they actually, um, when they go and they have their symptoms that are going on, that they feel that they're out of place and then they get judged and they get bullied. Um, Unfortunately, this is a power struggle. Um, individuals that are doing the bullying like that power, um, and then they look for any vulnerability that they can. So we really need to try to make sure that we provide as much as a, of a safe environment that we can. When they come to us, um, to talk to us as therapists, to talk to us as counselors, to talk to us as caseworkers, to talk to us as school social workers, no matter where they are, we need to make sure that we give them that open opportunity to like just talk to us and show that, hey, listen, we're here to be your friend and be in a safe environment because your life is important. Um, and that's really what we're coming down to here is that it's someone's life that uh, is in jeopardy. So there has to be a game plan to this. What can we do? Um, we see these statistics. I've shown you the statistics there previously. Um, this population is having experiencing severe um, suicidal ideations, suicide completions, suicide attempts. Um, it's scary, but there's got to be something that we can do to help. Now, I'm not asking us to go out there and change the um, everyone's way of thinking, to change everyone's way of um, believing, but there's things that we can do individually um, to help make this population feel safe and, and try to help those individuals, especially when they're in their crisis need. Um, I wanna talk about school policies real quick. Um, we need to check our school policies and their agencies for anti-discrimination policies on both sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, this kind of goes back to the part where I said, you know, when you have an application and it says, what sex are you? And it says male, female, and other, um, that's, you're not giving the opportunity for the, the individual to express how they really, you know, what they feel they are. And you're really just basically putting it back into those silos. We really need to change the way we have our policies. There might be things that we do in our, in our um, agencies or in a school that maybe aren't um, LGBTQIA friendly. Um, and, and not just in this population, but in other populations, maybe um, it's not senior friendly. It's not, um, 
youth friendly. It's not uh, race friendly, friendly. It's not religion friendly. And we're not trying to do that to be malicious, but we need to be conscious of what's going on in our environment um, and try to make it a safe environment as much as possible for those individuals. We need to make sure we show support uh, and it's visible. Um, I thought um, when I went to school, to college, I, I saw, and I'm sure a lot of you guys would see the triangle that's in the bottom right corner um, showing us a safe zone. It's important to know that individuals um, have someone to go to, have someone to talk to. Uh, I believe it's very important to make sure that that's visible. Um, either it's a sticker or a sign that's outside. It doesn't have to be big. It can be really, you know, it can be small, but they know to look for that sign to say, hey, listen, this staff member is someone that I can talk to that this is someone that is supportive of, you know, how I feel and what's going on and I can talk to them. If we don't have that, we're still building up those walls. We're still building up the gate and saying, hey, listen, don't come on in. You know, I don't want you to, I don't want to talk to you right now. I'm not comfortable talking to you. If they're not going to, if they feel that way, then they're going to start having, the, those symptoms are going to start feeling, the depression starts going to be um, increasing anxiety increases they feel like they're out of place they feel like they're getting bullied from their peers everything's going in the wrong direction but if they have a sticker that they can say hey i can go in and talk to this individual and i can really express how i truly feel you know a lot of times you'll pull someone into the office and talk to them and, and what they're going to tell you is, is you know i'm okay everything's fine i'll get through it and again that video at the end if you listen to it um it talks about an individual that one said, yeah, I'm okay. Don't worry. I'm fine. You know, I, it just, it was a bad day. It was a bad day, but it continues to be a bad day every day. Um, and they don't feel safe talking to that individual. So it's important to make sure that if you're um, willing to be that person that's willing to talk to them, make sure it's visible and that you're okay to talk to anybody that this, that's a safe environment for them to talk to and that they're willing to talk to you. Um, so review the uh, availability of information on this population for them. And this is going out to that. Remember I talked to you about the role model piece of it. Um, it I like, I have one of my, um, I guess it's a hobby. It's kind of a weird hobby is I'm, I'm a big people watcher. I like to watch people, see how they interact and what they're doing. I also like to go around and I look at libraries. Um, I also like to look at, you know, what are the things that they have on their, when I go into a doctor's office, is a good example, I like to read the magazines, all the different, mag not read all the magazines, but read the titles of all the magazines that are out there. I like to look around. If you don't have LGBTQIA um, pa um, pamphlets or books um, or uh, biographies they have here, documentaries or anything about that, they're probably not going to look at like, well, this is not a very safe environment. Um, when I go to the doctor's office, I see, you know, Sports Illustrated, I see um, Glamour, I see um, all those magazines that are really like, you know, the traditional magazines. But to think about it, if you had in your on your doctor's office um, or even in your counselor's practice or even in um, wherever you're working, if you had, you know, an LGBT um, or LGBTQIA uh literature or magazine or something that like the, an informational magazine um, out there. If I was a member that was here, I'd be like, oh, this is already accepting, you know, that they have something there that, you know, that shows that they care, that, you know, that they're interested, um, that it's a safe environment. Um, I'm not saying now go out and buy as what you can and put everything everywhere you can, but you need to at least make that environment safe. And this is a great way. Um, to show that, listen, you know, I'm accepting of everybody. You know, I have golfing magazine, senior magazine, LGBTQIA magazine. I've got, um, you know, fishing magazine and um, cosmetology magazine, you know. So you're you're showing that it's accepting area of everything. And it goes a long way, making sure that uh, information's available to them, that if they want that information, that it's there also. Um, intervene, this is a, uh, I'm gonna take questions after this slide. Um, intervene is actually a um, something I think is very important. We all know there's derogatory terms out there um, that we're not. Some people don't use the proper terms. Uh, the slide I have here, and this was written a lot for um, also the school system too, because this is where a lot of you'll see a lot of this um, going on. That uh, it says right here, 71.3 percent of LGBT students uh, hear the uh, homophobic remarks every day. 
it's real quick to throw your voice out there and throw that negative spot. Now, it's one thing that you hear it and then you pull the individual that's the victim in and you talk to them and say, hey, listen, they're just people that don't understand it's bullying and all that, but it needs to stop. Um, sometimes the individual that is actually saying the words needs to understand that, listen, this is not appropriate. This is part of bullying. And that's whole part of that no bullying process and, and saying that let's stop it right here and there. Um, rather than, um, and you'll see a slide that's going to come up here. It's my favorite slide of all time. I love it. Um, if we let this go on, it's eventually going to burn down everything because um, all you're doing is just letting it go on and you're not letting it go, um, not stopping it. All right, Tyler, questions? Yeah, we have quite a few, so I'm going to try to get to some of the ones that stand out, I guess. But um, uh, I'm Justin's going to be offering his uh, email address at the end, so you can definitely follow up with him. Um, what verbiage should be used uh, to talk about completed suicide attempts? Isn't the successful suicide attempt an outdated phrase? Yes, it is. <clears throat> yeah, you, you don't um, – successful – like my previous presentation I did, um, successful sounds like a positive term. Um, it sounds like, look, congratulations, you were successful. Um, completed suicide is the, what the term they wanted to use. Um, it, you try to refrain from those positive type words. For sure. Um, a couple people asking about subtle sort of ways that they can show their support for the LGBTQ, et cetera, like community, um, if they're working a school or if they have an office or whatever, but aren't able to post a sticker. Um, do you have any other just kind of creative ideas of how you could go about doing that? Excellent question. Excellent question. So uh, some of your agencies might not allow you to put the stickers on. I, uh, I understand. Um, there's nothing about jewelry you can't wear. Um, I have a friend of mine that wears a bracelet. Um, with the same colors on the bracelet, uh, everyone knows then that that's a sign of it. Um, you can wear uh, necklaces, buttons. Um, for females, there's the hair clips. Um, my wife wears a hair clip in her hair um, to show, you know, that you know she's a, you know that she's a friend that she can or an ally that she can uh, help out if anyone has any issues. Um, also, the other thing too is. Um, you can reach out to the community and tell that you're a friend uh, and an ally. And what's interesting about that is, is that you'll be then known as that individual to go to. Um, and then you don't need really a label right, or a sign or anything like that. Um, but I think like my biggest thing is the bracelet one because no one can stop you from putting a bracelet on your wrist um, to show you. And, then people, and that stands out or a button or a pin or something like that. Great. Yeah, good idea. Those are cool ideas. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, so someone who works in a very religiously conservative county, um, can you recommend any resources for adolescents that may counter the rejection and disapproval that kids often experience from their church, uh, church of origin, I guess? Okay. Um, that's interesting. So in my – in what I've researched and, and I've seen is that um, there's actually, to the person that wrote that, there's a YouTube clip, and I'd appreciate it if you actually emailed me personally. I will send you the link to that YouTube clip. BYU actually did a whole thing on this. Um, the reason, what they said was, is if you're in an environment, um, a community, we all know the communities that we're in, um, that we live in, that some of them are very um, conservative and some of them are not very conservative. And those that are in conservative, in a conservative area with um, obviously that religious background um, that's involved, they, there are places that they can reach out and they need to understand where they can reach out um, for that help to talk to. Um, they're the only church in the neighborhood might be the only, that, that one church that does not approve of um, the population or, or talks negatively towards that population. Um, but at the same time, they need to also understand that there's other resources that you can start that try to build that. Um, and you'll see later on the slide some of the uh, projects that you can do um, to make them feel that they're safe in an environment that, hey, listen, here's a community that you can feel safe in. And it might be only two or three people in the community, but at least it's two or three people that they didn't have before that they feel safe with. And eventually that might grow um, for them to actually feel that 
maybe that community would change. Uh, you know, we can all hope that eventually, you know, that the community will change into a positive way. But if we take it at one stride, one small step at each time. So I, I do have um, slides later on. Um, and one of them is like the Trevor, uh, Trevor project, you know, to really develop the community and, and make sure that's safe, even though that they have a church that says, hey, no, no, this is not right, you know, so. And uh, I guess we'll, one last one for now. Um, we had a few people asking about um, schools, our schools, educators being, you know, educated on this topic and trained on how they can be more supportive. Um, do you have any examples of schools or universities or colleges that have done it well? Just kind of explore that topic a little bit. There is actually projects out there that are right now, and actually my last two slides talk about that project and the statistics of that project um, that actually um, are starting to do what it is is making a safe environment. Um, and they've noticed that when they become stricter with their bullying process, especially to intervene here, um, or they show that they take a no tolerance towards that policy, that the numbers start decreasing when it comes to suicidal attempts or suicidal ideations, um, that the environment is safe all around for everyone. So I, I think that um, there is, and actually if everyone's patient, I'd be more than happy to um, uh, get that on to you and, and actually show it to you. And so it's, it's in a couple slides later. So I'll be right there with that. Cool. And then just a added yeah. thing. Do you have a reference page for um, all of these that, so that people can look into these references further? At the end. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then I and actually I have a, um, a whole list of references that I'll also email if they want to look at them too. Um, harassment and assaults. There's a lot of verbal and physical um, harassment and physical um, assaults are addressed in research. Um, it's known that there's actually um, individuals, once again, the aggressor or the bully um, is trying to um, show power uh, and through that they do a lot of verbal and physical harassment. So this is, a, this is an area that needs to be addressed also. Um, and it's frequently because of their orientation or their gender expression, um, they feel uncomfortable. So therefore, now they want to show their their aggression and bullying towards those individuals. And you can see over here um, that the verbal harassment's 81.9%, 38.8% of physical harassments, and an 18.3% of physical assaults at school because of their sexual orientation. And then you can see because of their gender expression, it's uh, verbal is 63. 27 for um, physical and uh, harassed, harassed and physical assault is 12%. Um, obviously, no one should ever lay their hands on any individual, but you can see that once you've shown that vulnerability, that they're willing to, um, that this statistic is pretty uh, scary itself too. So someone asked about um, what you can do is um, attend or help start a GSA, which is a uh, uh, gay straight alliance uh, in their area. Um, what this does is it's a positive impact for school climates for the LGBTQIA uh, students. It, a better school environment climate is a negative correlation with the suicidal thoughts, suicidal plans, and not suicidal attempts, which I told you before. Um, and, and at the very end, I'll show you the statistics of a lot of um, when they actually implemented this GSA uh, program in there. You can see right here that uh, felt unsafe because of their sexual orientation. When the school doesn't have a GSA program, um, there's almost a 16% decrease with those that do. Um, feels uh, unsafe because of their gender expression. You're looking at um, close to 10%, 11% um, decrease there. And missed at least one day of school in the past month. You can see that kids actually in are going to school more now. So those numbers are still high, don't get me wrong, but it's better to, uh, it's better than not having anything at all. Uh, inclusive curriculums, uh, only 22.4% of LGBTQIA students were taught positive uh, representation about the community, about their history in school. 17.9% had been taught negative content about um, the topics, uh, LGBTQIA uh, topics, which that number seems crazy that even 17% actually have been taught the negative content about it um, because we all know that there is no negative comment uh, negative comments about it at all anyways. Um, so to have someone actually being taught that shows to me that 
um, there's ignorance and that, that they don't understand the whole process as a staff um, in there. Staff and students should be educated, obviously, on uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, homophobia, and institutional discrimination. A, lo a lot of individuals are just, they just ignore this piece of it, especially those that live in those um, conservative areas, those rural areas, they need to understand, hey, listen, you know, this is what's going on. This is the population. Um, they're, they're not different from you and I. Um, understand what it is, and maybe those numbers will start to drop. Gatekeeper training. Um, this is, I think, amazing. Um, this is recognizing someone at risk for suicide, intervening those risks, and referring them to the appropriate resources. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide real quick. These are the different resources for the gatekeeper. I told you about the Trevor Project, um, con and then there's also state coalitions out there. Um, these are really good. Uh, and when I say gatekeeper, because we're all the gatekeepers, we all recognize individuals come to us. These are all different ways that we can help um, connect them to resources that will help them. Um, especially, I like the Trevor Project. That's one that I'm, I'm I give two thumbs up to. Um, I wanted to go real quick onto, and I, I'm I'm very advocate to touch up on the suicide assessment skills on there. The suicide assessment skills do not change just because we're in a different population. It's the same assessment skills that we use from population to population. But I just want to touch base on them real quick. And here's that picture that I like. Um, if we're an individual or we're a healthcare worker or we're a counselor or a crisis worker, whatever it is, if we don't recognize that there's an issue going on out there, that forest is going to keep burning. Uh, and then eventually it'll burn everything down to a death. So I like this picture and it, um, I, I look at this picture almost uh, as much as I can because it really motivates me to say, hey, listen, I wanna be that guy that's looking in the right direction um, or female that's looking in the right direction um, to make sure that uh, we're really doing what we can to stop this um, outbreak of suicide. We all know that the outcomes require several things to go wrong at one, all at once. Um, we know that there's multiple different factors that go on in someone individual's life um, that they will continue to happen and then once they all compound we start to get those um, thoughts of hurting themselves so this is a nice um, picture that depicts that that um, you know they have family risk um, they also might have a demographic issue uh, they might be abusing uh, substance abuse uh, along with having a severe mental health disorder at the same time they feel hopelessness they're intoxicated um, and they're also going through medical severe pain which then now they start having those thoughts, they start getting weapons, they start having a major loss, everything gets worse, you know, um, to the point that they're gonna result to suicidal. So it's not just one thing that we're looking at, we have to look at everything um, and all the risk factors. Which goes on to my signs that I want you to understand is risk factors are characteristics that um, will may it more likely that the individual will consider attempt uh, or die by suicide. Um, warning signs, behaviors that indicate that signs are immediate risk. Protective factors are characteristics that make it less likely for the individual that will consider to attempt or die by suicide. So I like to say that, you know, we want to make sure we know what all the risk factors are, which we, we always concentrate on. Um, the warning signs, what they're, uh, the behaviors that they're doing that are showing that they're an immediate risk. But we also need to recognize their protective factors um, because that might help us realize that, hey, listen, you know, there are good things going on there. Let's work on those protective factors to try to diminish those risk factors. Um, so risk factors, we always, uh, is path warm. Uh, we have ideation, substance abuse, uh, uh, propulsiveness, anxiety, uh, trapped, hopelessness, withdrawal, anger, recklessness, mood changes, whoopsie. Um, these are things to look at for the risk factors. Um, if you don't there's multiple other risk factors on top of this all, but this is just, you know, a, a good acronym to remember to look for um, when we're talking to the individual that's out there that's experiencing any of that. Um, problems that increase suicidal risks. Uh, we always want to make sure that we check to see if they had any prior suicide attempts, any mental health disorder, history of trauma or abuse. Um, if they have a history of trauma or abuse, they're, they're more likely to uh, feel that they're going to um, result to be a suicidal risk. A family history of suicide, um, there's been his, um, reports out there that show a link between a family history and a lack of social support, which goes back to what I said previously in this um, uh, presentation is that if we don't have a, a safe environment for them to go into with social supports, they feel alone, they feel isolated, and they feel like they have nowhere to turn to go to.
situations that increase suicide risk, uh, major physical illness, losses, bullying, uh, easy access to lethal means, and local clusters of suicide. Um, I, I think that these are important things to, when these situations happen, we need to start thinking, okay, is the individual safe? Um, are they okay to go home? Are they okay to be in a safe environment, uh, be in the environment that they're in? Um, these are trigger things in the back of my head and say, hey, listen, we need to start looking to see if they have any suicidal risk. Um, access to means, firearms are used in 58% of all suicides. Um, I think that's important to know. Um, this was actually, um, I think this is pretty interesting. The highest state in uh, our country is 65% of West Virginia homes uh, have fire, West Virginia homes have firearms. Um, ironically, West Virginia also has a very severe um, suicidal rate. They have a very high suicidal rate. Um, so there is a link between firearms and homes. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why we asked that question. Do you have any firearms in your home? Um, we don't ask that just because we're trying to say, oh, you know, firearm is used as a way of hurting their individual. It's been proven that if there's firearms in the home, there's, that's a link to maybe a, uh, a risk of hurting someone uh, or themselves. Um, firearms are even more prevalent in suicides involving alcohol. Obviously, when someone's intoxicated, that um, they're going to find other means to use and go over that threshold when it's too late um, and they're not able to make that um, rational thinking um, at that time. Uh, warning signs, uh, acquiring guns or stocking up pills. So a lot of the individuals might, you know, look for um, ways of t hurting themselves. Uh, talking about they want to die or kill them, uh, kill oneself. Um, maybe that's to their friends. Maybe it's joking around, but they'll start. They'll say somewhere that they're going to, you know, that they want to hurt themselves. The impulsiveness or risk taking. Um, that's uh, that's an interesting. That that's actually um, kind of important too is that you know they start taking those risks that they didn't take before um, because hey what happens if something happens doesn't bother me I'll just you know I'll get what I want at the end anyways which is not living um, giving away prized possessions you know giving away those things that they they liked to make sure the other individuals have it that they have nothing left self destructive acts like are cutting um, the point I want to also say with cutting too is is be, you know that that's a risk factor um, on there, but it's also a behavioral thing that might not be linked to suicidal uh, ideations, but always mark it down as, you know, that's a, that's a risk factor. Uh, increased drug and alcohol abuse, they use that as uh, self-medicating, trying to find a way to get away from having those negative thoughts or feeling uh, depressed or anxiety, and uh, talking about no reason to live. Um, recently, I had an individual um, talk to me in a jokeful manner, you know, um, sitting there talking to me about, oh, you know, I, 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 it's not worth me living, you know, you know, who cares if I, you know, die, no one's here to even care about that, and just joking, like laughing, you know, you would never even know. Um, about a couple of days later, um, he seriously thought about taking his own life. Um, we intervened, obviously, and got him to the right resources that he needed to go to, um, but I could have brushed off, like that fire, that fire that was there, and said, oh, he's just joking with me, you know, it's nothing really serious, but that's when saying, hey, that's a red flag, you know, even if it's a joking thing, you take it up as a red flag and then narrow it down that, okay, it was a joking thing and not a serious matter, but we took it as a serious matter, even though he was joking um, with us and said, okay, something's wrong here. We need to keep an eye on him. And we monitored him uh, regularly for the next couple of days, you know, making sure he was okay and found out that, yes, there was actually an underlining thought that he was going to do it. Um, and he had a plan and everything. Um, and I asked him at that time, do you have a plan? No, no plan. Um, I don't even know. I'm not even thinking about it. I was just joking. You know, we were just joking around. So I think it's important that we we don't take anything as a joke, that we continue to um, address the issues as they come on. Um, indirect um, or coded verbal clue cues. I think this is what I hinted to just there. Uh, I'm tired of life. I just can't go on. Now, yeah, we all say that once in a while. Um, you know, it just but it's really making sure that our uh, consumers are really um, understood and that we just don't brush it off. My family would be better off without me. Um, some people, most of us probably said that once in a while or thought of it in our head, but it's, it's like, do they really feel that way? And really explore these questions. When they say that to you, you know, just don't brush that question off. Really 
really go in depth and ask those questions and say, you know, what do you mean by your family would be better off without you? Um, have you thought about hurting yourself? Um, there's been no links whatsoever saying that if you start asking them, have they thought about hurting themselves? Do they have a plan that they'd be like, oh, you know what? I didn't think about that. That's a great idea. You know, there's no link behind that. Um, ask those questions, find out where their head is, because our whole goal is to make sure that our consumers are safe. Um, who cares if I'm dead anyway? Uh, I just went out. I won't be around much longer. Pretty soon you won't have to worry about me. Like they're all things that, you know, some people might say out of frustration or say out of whatever, but um, don't take it lightly. Really find out what's going on. Ask those questions. Um, leave no stone unturned because you'd rather have someone alive than find out the next day that, oh, I could have done something else or asked something else. Um, so what do you do for the individual? Take it seriously. Like I told you, almost 80% of all suicides have given some kind of warning in their intentions. Ask directly, like I told you, if you think that someone is suicidal, ask them about it. Um, sometimes I've known in all my time here that I've worked that there was only one case where there was no warning signs ever given. Other than that, there's been always a warning sign. It may be subtle, like we have, you know, with the indirect or coded verbal cues, but there's always something that's being said that um, that we could pick out, and it might be subtle. So, really, you know, refer to someone if if you feel uncomfortable handling it. Refer to the crisis um, unit in your area. Refer to somewhere where they can, you know, pick up try to pick up the skills. It's better to, for them to be angry that you made that referral and be alive than not be angry at you and not be with us. Uh, tip for asking questions. Uh, if in doubt, don't wait to ask the question. Uh, if the person is reluctant, be persistent. Talk to the person alone or in a private setting. Sometimes they don't want to talk in front of their family. Maybe they don't want to talk in front of their uh, brother or sister who talk, brought them in. Um, allow that person to talk freely. Give them plenty of time. And then use resources that are handy. Um, what to do, be genuine. Listen and don't show. Um, the shock factor or disapproval, that's the worst thing you can do is when they say, oh, you know, I want to hurt themselves, be like, oh, my gosh, oh, what are we going to do? What do we got to go? You know, just be like, OK, you know, what can we do? What can I do to help you out? What can we do to make this, you know, better for you to make you feel safe? Um, show that you care that it's more important uh, than saying the right thing. Um, avoid trying to explain uh, way the feeling. You sometimes just need to just, hey, let's figure this out. Um, you have a lot to live for. Um, you're, you are just confused right now. You don't want to say that kind of stuff. You just want to um, really try to find out what's going on and fix that crisis right then and there so that you can continue to build that um, process and move them in a positive area. Um, so stay there. Don't leave them alone. Uh, you know, don't say, okay, hey, uh, especially on the phone, don't say, hey, you know, I'm going to hang up. I'll get someone over there. Stay with them. Continue to be with them. Um, seek help, be actively involved in seeking their professional help. Uh, plan for safety, you know, no use of drugs, link to resources, disable the uh, safety plan, uh, disable the suicide plan, link for services and plan for a life. Um, really make sure that we have a safe, a good safe plan um, when dealing with the suicidal ideations. Um, so detect the potential risk, assess for the risk, uh, assessing for the risk, manage the suicidality, have a safety plan, crisis support plan, patient tracking, and then make sure they get the mental health treatment that they need to continue on an ongoing basis. I talked about that Q, um, the GSA. I think this is kind of interesting in that, I, this is what I wanted to close on um, with, that this was a national school climate survey that was done um, with the uh, um, GSAs. And what they did was, if you can see that they implemented all these positive things for the LGBTQIA community and start talking to the staff and talking to individuals about everything and, and explaining what's going on. And here's the interesting piece of that. You can see that the victimization has decreased. You see that the verbal harassment went down, that the physical harassment went down, um, and the physical assault went down as they implemented those. So it has shown us that if we can educate our staff educate the community and, and show that, listen, hey, you know, what's going on is, you know, um, destructive in behavior and that we want to try to build a positive behavior um, that we can see that we're saving lives, um, that we're making sure that people feel safe and that they're in a, a good environment.